Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to our special United Nations Asia Pacific Regional Commemoration of Human Rights Day 2020. I'm Elizabeth Puranam, correspondent and presenter with Al Jazeera based in New Delhi, India, and I have the great pleasure of uh, being your host today. Now, Human Rights Day comes amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, a crisis that the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has termed the most formidable global challenge since World War II. The public health toll has been staggering. We're approaching 70 million confirmed cases worldwide with over 1.5 million deaths. Health systems have been devastated, along with frontline health workers of whom we've lost far too many in the line of duty. But there's another impact that's not perhaps widely discussed or recognized and that on human rights across the spectrum, especially of the most marginalized and vulnerable populations. One of the lessons we have learned from the crisis is that people and societies can change quickly. While the past months have been difficult, we are determined to not only recover what we've lost, but to build back a better world that is far more equal, fair, inclusive and green. A world where human rights, including for the vulnerable and marginalized populations, are at the heart. And so today uh, we're discussing how we can put human rights at the core of recovery from the pandemic in Asia and the Pacific, and what this means in terms of moving beyond rhetoric to concrete action. So 17 UN agencies have come together through their Asia Pacific regional offices um, to conceptualize this curated collection of inspiring talks linked to the theme of recovering better with human rights at the center. To unpack this through real life examples and stories, we'll be joined by some truly inspiring people from across the region. And we also want to give you, our audience, the opportunity to weigh in with what you think regional and global priorities should be in building back better. So for this, we're asking you to log on uh, from your phone or your computer to the Mentimeter and have uh, your say, you just go to menti.com, that's m.e.n.t, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's m-e-n-t-i rather, dot com, and uh, type in the code 301-6444, that's 301-6444, menti.com, 301-6444, you'll see a simple question um, to which you can provide multiple answers in just a few words, and we will be coming back to the menti meter um, towards the end of the event and see what you've shared. Now, before we turn to our speakers, let's first hear from Ilse brands Kerry. she's Assistant Secretary General from the UN Office um, of the High Commissioner for Human Rights or UN Human Rights. This year's Human Rights Day falls at a time we will never forget. The COVID-19 pandemic has been devastating, but we have a unique opportunity to recover better to build the world we want. For that, we must learn from the lessons of this crisis in Asia and the Pacific and elsewhere. First, end all forms of discrimination and address underlying gaps in human rights protection that make certain groups more fragile and vulnerable. Discrimination against women has worsened in most areas of life, from economic opportunities, poverty and unpaid work, to the scaling down of sexual and reproductive health, health rights and a rise in violence against women. Migrants and refugees have also been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. They are unable to protect themselves from the virus because they are forced to live and work in overcrowded and unhygienic conditions and denied equal access to public health responses and social protection. We have also seen alarming spikes in hate speech amid growing intolerance and xenophobia with migrants and minorities stigmatized and unjustifiably blamed for the spread of virus. Second, address widespread inequalities. Already marginalized communities in Asia and the Pacific are those for whom life changed the most. Devastating economic impact and loss of livelihoods are affecting economic and social rights 
and exacerbating vulnerabilities, including the right to health, social protection and decent work, as well as the rights to adequate food, housing, water and sanitation. Women represent approximately 70% of frontline workers dealing with the pandemic, and many of them are migrant workers. With shortage of personal protective equipment, women have continued to provide essential services despite great personal risks. Universal social protection, universal health coverage, and other systems for the delivery of fundamental rights are not luxuries, but rights in and of themselves. They're also necessary for societies to thrive and help shape a more equitable future. With the COVID-19 vaccine within reach, states must ensure vaccines and treatments for everyone who needs them, with distribution guided by human rights principles and international solidarity. Third, encourage participation especially for young people and civil society. As governments have tried to close their societies under the excuse of protecting them, long-standing concerns for the erosion of democratic space, participation, rule of law, and fundamental freedoms have resurfaced. Journalists and human rights defenders have come under even fiercer attack. Brushing public grievances aside is not the way forward. We need more diverse voices to shape our common future. Fourth, increase and intensify our resolve and efforts to tackle climate change. The climate crisis in the region and globally is the greatest threat to, th to human rights. It threatens our livelihoods and provokes natural disasters. The effects are felt by everyone but are hitting hardest those who least contributed to climate change. For many in the region, this is now literally a matter of life and death. Finally, even during the pandemic when numerous UN activities were cancelled or moved online, incidents of intimidation and reprisals continued to be reported. I call on governments to safeguard civic space. NGOs and human rights defenders should be an essential part of the recovery plans. When the Secretary General in February launched the call to action for human rights, he said that human rights cannot be an afterthought in times of crisis. This unprecedented global crisis is the time to make sure that people and their rights are at the front and center of response and recovery. Join me in standing up for human rights. Thank you. And our thanks to Ilse brands Carries for setting the scene for us. Now, the world has committed to achieving sustainable development goals grounded in human rights and gender equality by 2030. But the pandemic has jeopardized their trajectory, rolling back hard won gains on so many fronts. We have also in the region, as in others, um, seen the power of young voices and how youth are leading the movement towards a better future, a better world. Now, this is the backdrop for a special address from Lave Tana Langiseru, who joins us all the way from Fiji in the Pacific. Lagi is the co-founder of the Alliance for Future Generations. That's a networker led by young people with a fo focus on sustainable development. Lagi, it's great to have you with us. Now, how can young persons, indeed all of us, help salvage the future despite the formidable challenges? Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Bulavinaka and good morning. Um, it gives me great pleasure and honor to, uh, to be part of this event um, under the theme, Recovering Better uh, from COVID-19 with human, with human Rights at the Core. Um, please allow me to first share a personal reflection uh, where a few days ago, I came across a social media post of a friend of mine who had just welcomed the birth of his first ever niece. A post with the caption that read, welcome to this cruel world, my precious. This statement for me had me uh, reeling back uh, because it captures the sense of hopelessness that exists there 
for many young people who are coming uh, into the future that we are building. 72 years ago, as we know, the world rose from the ashes of a war-torn world with so much pain and suffering and lost future for many to create a universal document that today has become a beacon of hope for humanity and ensuring that the promotion, protection and the respect of the rights of all human anywhere, everywhere on the face of this planet. Mm -hmm. Human rights um, today in our region uh, continues, we, today in our region, we continue to face multiple unprecedented crises, climate change, the global health pandemic of COVID-19 and unsustainable economic development. that have exacerbated and threatened the social fabrics, way of life and human rights of people. Everywhere across our world and in the region, people are suffering and more so women, girls and people of diverse sexual orientation and gender identities. People with disabilities and other vulnerable and often marginalized groups are facing systemic levels of discrimination, gender-based violence, multiple forms of abuse and unequal access to social and economic opportunities. Our planetary boundaries have been under attack from our unsustainable production, distribution, and consumption patterns. And the economic models that we've put, that we have, puts profit before people and the planet. This has threatened livelihoods, food, water, and health security, cultural and indigenous people's rights. COVID-19, like any other emergencies and disasters, have shown us the deepening cracks of existing social and economic inequalities. Many across the region, especially young people, face the immediate loss of unemployment and livelihoods due to restrictions and lockdowns, challenges to accessing education, affordable health care, including mental health services, sexual reproductive health, and accessing social protection services. Workers are being laid off work without proper due processes being followed, a breach of labor and workers' rights. Those of diverse sexual orientation and gender identities are being victimized and blamed for the causes of disasters and even the pandemic COVID-19 and are further pushed to the peripheries. Cases of brutality from national security forces towards citizens are not unheard of and reports are increasing ever more in this COVID-19 pandemic with a culture of impunity that continues to thrive. As much as many young people try to have faith in our justice and legal systems, it is proving hard given the growing skepticism as perpetrators are not held accountable or brought forward and their actions for their actions nor brought to justice. As development and com community practitioners, this requires more of us to pull together the threads of inclusion, harmony, tolerance and mutual understanding. There's a strong need to strengthen intersectional analysis that interrogates any intervention with multiple power systems, including that of gender, class, race, ethnicity, ability and or disability, so that we do not leave anyone behind. We need to listen more to the heartbeat and feel the pulse of our communities, our people, and more so the, the most vulnerable and those who are often marginalized. We need to act more boldly and decisively to defend, promote, and respect human rights. And in order to do this, and in order to change systems, we need to change people's mindsets and behaviors. People make up the system. Lagi, Lagi it's Elizabeth here. I'm so sorry to um, interrupt you, but I just wanted to make sure that you have your camera on because we're not able to see you. Is your camera on? Uh, yes, it is. Your camera is on? It is, yes. Okay, sorry, it must be um, some kind of a technical difficulty. We'll try and um, get that fixed so that we can see you. Again, I'm sorry for interrupting. Please continue. Awareness must infiltrate even to the deeper recesses of, family, of a family unit, to the most rural, remote and maritime areas, and human rights must not only become a conversation,
but that each and every one must respect, defend, and protect human rights of other people, whether it be in homes, schools, communities, workplaces, faith settings, and public spaces, both online and offline. Everyone has a role to play. Governments and duty bearers must ensure that the rights and freedoms of its citizens are respected and protected, including the rights of indigenous people, LGBTQI, children, people with disabilities, and people in vulnerable situations. The right to development must be underpinned by strong human rights-based approach, gender equality, empowerment of women, and intergenerational equity. National human rights institutions, in order to become credible, should be effective, robust, and independent. And we'll only be able to do this if they, if they have the adequate powers, adequate resources, cooperative methods, and are engaging with the international bodies. Civil society and non-governmental organization also play a critical role in advocacy and also in holding states accountable as duty bearers. For so many years, CSOs and NGOs have demonstrated the effectiveness of being the ears and the voice for the people. We need to listen to them. We need to invite them to decision-making spaces and we need to support them in their work, especially as we work to rebuild back better our, our communities. Human rights should not be an abstract idea. It shouldn't be a Western concept or ideology. We must find the common core values of love, respect, duty of care and equality in our own context and bring us and bring this together as a community and as humanity. I'd like to end with a quote from the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I quote, to make life a little better for people less fortunate than you, that's what I think is a meaningful life is. One lives not just for oneself, but for one's community, unquote. Ladies, gentlemen, and people of diverse gender identities, these are words we should breathe and live by if we are to build back better and stronger, placing people and human rights at the center. And happy Human Rights Day to everyone. Thank you. Lagi, thank you very much for that. And apologies that we weren't able to see your screen, but we will try to um, try to get that fixed. Now, before we move on to our next speaker, I just want to uh, remind our audience that we want to hear from you on what you think that re uh, regional and global uh, priority should be in building back better with human rights um, at the core of any recovery, especially in the Asia Pacific. You can go to Mentimeter, that's M-E-N-T-I dot com and uh, put in the code. The code is 3016444. That's 3016444. It will ask you for a simple question um, and you can put in your input there and we will be looking at uh, what people are asking for at the end of the session. Now I would like to bring in our next, um, next speaker. The pandemic has ravaged economies from developing to developed nations in a number of ways and few countries, if any, have been spared. And this has devastated the livelihoods of many with millions at risk of falling into poverty. Hard won gains in gender equality are also under threat and the current economic models are being challenged. Joining us now to weave all these strands together is the noted development economist, Jayati Ghosh, who taught economics at the Jawaharlal Nehru University uh, in New Delhi for 35 years and will join the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, USA from January 2021. Ms. Ghosh specializes in international economics, employment patterns in developing countries, macroeconomics policy, issues related to gender and development. Professor Ghosh, it is a pleasure to have you with us. Um, can you spell out what building back economies underpinned by human rights looks like in particular for our region? Thank you, Elizabeth. It's a really great pleasure to be here and to be able to listen to so many diverse but quite inspirational positions. I think we all know what the problem is. We all, I mean, it's already been laid out very clearly in terms of how the pandemic has exposed the inequalities, has added to them, 
and is making even our ability to deal with ongoing challenges like climate change that much more difficult. It's also true that the Asia Pacific region is very diverse in terms of the response to the pandemic. Uh, some countries have done much better than others, as we know, in controlling the disease, in terms of limiting the adverse impact on economies and livelihoods. Again, some countries have done remarkably well. Most of us have not. And despite these differences, I would argue that there are some important commonalities in terms of what we need to do going forward. And really the idea is not just to make economies more resilient and sustainable, of course it is. But I think it's really now a question of human survival. And we now know that if you like, the coronavirus is just the beginning of a series of shocks that is necessarily going to come our way. Climate change is also going to generate a whole range of shocks. And we are prone to many different kinds of challenges which we have to learn to cope with in addition to creating better conditions for economic justice and, and all of the other things that have been mentioned. So I would say that there are really four broad areas in which we need to focus. Um, the first is in terms of public investment in care. Now, that's kind of obvious, right? The pandemic has brought out how crucial care economy is. And so this must be a priority for the future. We know that we will not get any kind of economic resilience even. Forget the sufferings of people. We, the economies also collapse if we do not adequately invest in healthcare. And the countries that have not done so are really badly affected and will continue to be badly affected for much longer than the countries that did invest in care. What does that mean? We have to recognize care work, unpaid, underpaid, and paid. We have to reward them properly. We have to respect them. We have to represent them. And we have to reduce the unpaid part, which is dominantly performed, as you all know, by women, by as much as possible, by redistributing it. It's very important also to provide dignity and social protection to care work. It's remarkable to me that in the middle of this pandemic, when in fact, it should have been so obvious, it's so blatant that we need to protect care workers, in, across the region, they are not the ones who have been protected. They are not even being rewarded. Sometimes they're not even being paid on time because governments are strung, uh, are tightening their budgets and, and all kinds of other things. So that I would argue is number one, absolutely crucial also for gen gender equity for obvious reasons. To recognize, reward, redistribute unpaid care, represent, respect care work. The second is very important. I, there are so many young people on this panel and I'm sure they will raise this as well. Uh, one of the most pressing problems is employment generation. It's uh, especially for women. Women have been disproportionately affected during the pandemic and youth. They there's an uncertain future. In a sense, we could even have been destroying the prospects for a generation, especially in the countries where economies have been even more devastated. So we need to have proactive public policies, make employment generation the central thing, not GDP growth, because GDP growth, as we know, doesn't always generate jobs. It doesn't even necessarily go to most of the people. It can be concentrated in finance, in certain services which go, you know, benefit the very rich and so on. So we need proactive policies which focus on employment generation and which would then generate a sort of bubbling up of growth rather than the trickle down that we have been taught to appreciate. What does that mean? It means certainly investment in care because we know that that's very employment intensive, but also in the creative industries, which actually improve the quality of life and which are not subject to the kinds of technological change that will destroy jobs rather than create new ones. And we need to invest in public employment programs with high multiplier effects. So basically we have to think of the government as an employer to become a catalyst, to become a generator of new employment in secondary forms. That is going well beyond the old idea of you know, skill development. That's no longer adequate. Of course, we need to develop new skills, but we can't simply say government should do skill development and sit back and then the market will take care of it because it won't. So that's another essential element of what we have to think of ahead. Third, I think it's already been mentioned, and climate change, especially in our region, it's no longer in the future. It's already upon us, and it's having devastating consequences on human security, especially the security of women and girls, on inequality, on human rights. 
we have to have much more massive public investment in adaptation, in climate resilience, in social protection systems that allow people to cope and to evolve to deal with these new challenges. Now, again, this is an area which generates a lot more secondary employment. So it will also add to the employment generating kinds of uh, concerns that I had noted earlier. So what does it mean? It requires a new deal. Uh, a new deal is something that would essentially uh, go in for regulation, redistribution, and recovery based on major public spending. So I've talked about the public spending part. We need to regulate a whole range of markets and industries. We need to redistribute. And so we need a new deal. People have talked about a green new deal. I'm saying we have to have a multicolored new deal. Of course, it has to be green for climate alleviation and, and all of those concerns. It has to be blue because we really have major concerns about water, the pollution and scarcity of water in our region particularly. It has to be purple because the care economy is a purple economy. That's the color of the care economy and we really have to focus on the care economy. And it has to be red because the for greater egalitarianism because the inequalities that we have achieved right now are beyond any historical uh, antecedents and we really have to undo them before they destroy our societies and make them unlivable. So, all of this means we cannot rely on private finance and innovative finance, public-private partnerships, et cetera, to work. We really have to have that combination of recovery through public investment, regulation, redistribution. We have to tax multinationals at the same rate and digital companies at the same rate that we tax domestic companies. We have to have very, very small rates of wealth taxation on the very, very rich, the ultra rich. And this can be enabled by international cooperation and global asset registers. All of this will generate the necessary financing. We have to think big because you know the alternative to not thinking big and not getting together and doing something is I believe is actually human survival, which is at stake. And so I think it's important that there are young people here who have much more uh, apt to lose than any of us and who are there with the ideas, and I think there with greater international solidarity than our generation has shown anyway. So I'm still hopeful for the future. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Ghosh, for that inspiring and, and, and hopeful, that positive message um, full of solutions. Thank you very much for that. Um, I want to um, move on to our uh, next speaker now, because earlier this year, as the United Nations was mapping out the the impacts of COVID-19 globally. The chair of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, that's Arne Norgam, made an appeal to governments and the UN not to ignore the special needs of Indigenous people amid the pandemic. Now, Indigenous people have long been disadvantaged in a myriad ways, and even when programs are available ostensibly for their benefit, they continue to be stigmatized and discriminated against on many fronts. Well, joining us now to discuss this is Joan Carling, an Indigenous human rights and environment defender from the Philippines. She was the Secretary General of the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, AIPP, from 2009 to 2016, and is currently the co-convener of the Indigenous Peoples Major Group for Sustainable Development. Ms. Carling received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the UN Environment Programme in 20. 18. Ms. Carling, thank you for being with us. Um, and we want to ask you what, um, what you would like to share your message on Human Rights Day uh, would be through the lens of Indigenous people's rights. Thank you, Lisa, and good day to everyone. Betty Belen, an Indigenous woman leader in the Cordillera Philippines, was arrested last October 25 and remained in jail based on Trump up charge of illegal possession of firearms allegedly found in her house. She is leading the protest against geothermal project in her tribe's territory since 2012. In the Chittagong Hill Trucks in Bangladesh, the Moro indigenous communities are holding demonstrations against the building of a five-star hotel that will displace them. In Kalimantan, Indonesia, traditional leader Effendi Bunhing, along with two indigenous youth, were arrested when they were trying to stop the expansion of oil palm plantation in their community. 
Many more of these cases of human rights violations against indigenous peoples are taking place across the Asia Pacific region during this time of COVID-19 pandemic. As we celebrate today the International Human Rights Day, it is paramount to put rights at the core of recovery. Of the 476 million indigenous peoples across the world, 72% is in the Asia Pacific region with more than 370 million. Indigenous peoples are 15% of the poorest while only 6.2% of the global population. Only 10% of the global customary land claimed by indigenous peoples have legal recognition. Further, the majority of indigenous peoples in Asia are not legally recognized as indigenous peoples with collective rights affirmed by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The COVID-19 pandemic has thus aggravated and magnified the systemic discrimination and marginalization of indigenous peoples as manifested by the disproportionate impacts of the pandemic to our health, education of indigenous children and youth, violence against women, and our livelihood and well-being. Indigenous peoples across the globe protect 60 to 80% of the world's biodiversity due to our lifestyle of living in harmony with nature. Further, evidence shows that forest and biodiversity are better managed and conserved by indigenous peoples compared to those managed by states. Moreover, indigenous peoples' food systems are more sustainable and healthier than the present highly commercial, commercialized food production. Thus, the legal recognition and protection of the rights of indigenous peoples in the Asia Pacific region is imperative for the protection of the environment and for building back better. More violations of the rights of indigenous peoples to our lands, territories, and resources will result to more destruction of the environment and the loss of biodiversity, which can lead to another virus. An alarming trend in the region is that many of the economic recovery plans include large scale mining, such as coal, forest and land conversion for agribusiness, mega infrastructure projects, among others, under a build back business as usual approach. This will aggravate inequality and environmental disasters. In fact, a number of states are now even weakening the prote their protection measures for the environment to hasten investments such as in Indonesia, India, and the Philippines. Further, human rights violations associated with business activities supported by states have worsened with the growing number of authoritarian states in the Asia region. In fact, restrictions to prevent the spread of the virus are being used as an excuse to also restrict legitimate actions to protect the environment against business projects, unfair economic measures, worsening inequality, and the lack of access to justice, among others. Thus, in building back better, economic growth targets should not in, should ensure equity and the protection of the environment. Economic growth must not be imposed at the expense of the environment's equity and human rights. States and the private sector, corporations, investors, and business need to ensure due diligence measures for the respect and protection of human rights and the environment in any business activities in support to economic recovery and growth targets. Likewise, social equity measures shall be established and enforced to ensure that these economic targets do not worsen inequality and discrimination. It is essential to ensure the balanced implementation of sustainable development goals which comprise the social, environmental, and economic dimensions and seek to realize human rights of all. Under this framework, we can effectively recover and advance sustainable development by building multi-stakeholders partnerships with the rights holders at the front and center. This will ensure that recovery plans are responsive to the needs 
and perspectives of the most marginalized, vulnerable, and discriminated. The COVID-19 pandemic and the recent climate disasters should serve as a wake-up call for humanity to change and transform the way we use political power and the way we relate with nature and the environment. We need to learn from and put into action the sustainable systems and values of indigenous peoples by building back better and advancing sustainable development. To conclude, it is necessary to put human rights, social equity, environmental sustainability and accountability as the framework of recovery actions for us to transform our world towards a sustainable future for the people and the planet. Thank you. Ms. Carling, thank you very much for that. Um, and before we move on to the second part and hear from um, our next lot of speakers, I just want to mention the things that are being uh, said on Mentimeter.com. We've, of course, asked our audience to send in their suggestions for what they think global regional priorities should be in building back better. Um, that's at Menti.com using the code 3016444. Uh, we have many suggestions, but um, trending right now, I mean, the biggest one is human rights defenders. Um, we also have children's rights, gender equality, and freedom of expression. Now, we're going to move on and, and hear from some inspiring speakers from um, around the Asia Pacific region. And just last week, we marked the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. That's an annual observance uh, that had special significance um, in this year of the pandemic when the rights of persons with disabilities were compromised on many fronts. Joining us now from Oxford University in England is a remarkable young woman, Pratishtha Deveshwar, who recently made history by becoming the first person um, the first person with disabilities from India to study at that prestigious institution. She's also been a spokesperson for the Indian government's flagship program for the right of all girls to education to fulfill their potential. Um, Pratishta, you were injured in a horrific car crash as a teenager, which wasn't actually very long ago. A lot of people thought that your potential had been snuffed out, but you have more than prove them wrong, fighting for your rights as well as uh, those of persons with disabilities in a society that hasn't fully embraced this issue. Why do you feel that um, there was a need to fight for your rights and what motivated you to do so? Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for that introduction and a very good morning to all of you. Uh, from the UK where it is currently night, but you know, hearing to all of you, it actually feels like there is light everywhere. It's all bright. There is hope. So it feels like a morning to me here. Um, as Elizabeth rightly said that I met with a road accident a few years back. And uh, re just to recall the medical report that I got, it said that I am now a paraplegic. Uh, it mentioned that I had lost my bladder and bubble control. I had lost my ability to feel or move anything below my chest. So I being the hopeless optimist person that I am, I looked at that medical report and I thought, okay, that's it, that's okay. I think I can deal with it. But little did I know at that point that the, my life outside of that hospital was going to completely change. And it was not just the impairment that I was going to deal with, but also the disability that is going to come as soon as I'm going to enter the world. And uh, I'm gonna tell you how it actually changed my life. I remember wheeling out of the hospital for the first time and, and, and people were staring at me and making comments as if I was an alien. You know, um, I, 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 I often say this, that when you look at the word PWD, person with disability, the word person comes before the word disability. And as a 13 year old back then and a 22 year old today, I fail to realize why do people not understand that I am a person, a human being with the same human rights first and disabled second. When someone looks at me, they don't look at me per se. They completely ignore my gorgeous smile they don't want to know about my talents and they don't care about my educational achievements. When someone looks at me, they just look at my wheelchair because for them, my wheelchair is me and I am my wheelchair. And that 
just just brings out some weird stereotypes uh, and stigma around people with disabilities, which which actually deprives deprives me and my community of the right to dignity, a dignified life. So when I, of course, went out and I wanted to go back home after my after being discharged from the hospital, I looked for a cab. But that is when I realized that no cabs, no transport options are accessible for people using wheelchairs, no trains, no auto rickshaws, um, no buses, nothing was accessible. And my right to freedom of movement was taken away from me. Being a person who loved studying, I wanted to go back home and rejoin my school. But guess what? No school in my city or even in my neighboring cities was wheelchair accessible. And for one whole year, I had to drop out of my school. And after that, I had to miss out on classroom education. And I was homeschooled for my entire school years. And of course, that affected my right to education. After that came the, of course, the pandemic. And there were already so many challenges in the lives of people with disabilities going on. And I was like, now what? What next? So I remember I was living uh, independently in New Delhi and there was a caregiver who used to come twice a day to you know, help me with my physiological needs. And when the lockdown was imposed, um, uh, there was a, obviously movement was restricted and there was a list of essential services that was released by the government and people could move out only for the reasons mentioned in that list. And that list had no mention of caregivers. So myself and so many people with disabilities in India who were dependent on caregivers for everyday tasks were left hanging and we didn't know what to do. And those two months were terrifying. You know, it's just that people who were making those policies never thought about the rights of people with disabilities. And it was, it was a huge struggle. And after that, we got, uh, we got back this right. But the problem is that we, we do, should not have to fight for these rights. This is something that should come very naturally. And even after that, uh, I, ha I had to obviously move back to my house. And uh, when I decided that, uh, I had to speak to the local police officer to allow me to go back to my house. And he spoke to my parents and he said, you know what, do you not love your daughter? She is a woman with a disability and you allowed her to stay alone in New Delhi away from your house, which is in Punjab. And uh, that is extremely wrong and you should never allow that after this. So, you know, this pandemic has been it's been snatching independence, it's been reinforcing stereotypes, and that has been, uh, you know, it has always been challenging. And that is why I think this day, the day of human rights is so, so, so important to me and my community, because we actually, if you see one by one, all my human rights were taken away from me, just because now I was a person with a disability. And this is why this discussion is so relevant. The UDHR document is so important. It is so important to implement every single thing that is written in there. Because, you know, 70% people with disabilities in India do not have employment. 75% do not attend schools. And it is high time. And I think this is why you asked, why do I feel the need to fight? Because I think that those people need me and they just don't need me. They need each one of you listening right now. We all have to get together, be allies to people with disabilities and work yeah. together to make an inclusive world. Well, thank you very much for that, Pratish. Then, you know, you were really touching on what Ms. Ghosh was talking about earlier as well, which is the importance of care workers uh, that were really seen highlighted in this pandemic possibly more so than 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 ever before. Um, thank you again. Now, we are going to go to Matrika in in Nepal. When we use the phrase, the right to health, many uh, assume it refers to physical health, but it includes mental health as well. That's an issue um, that's gained all the more prominence amid the pandemic with isolation and other challenges confronting millions of people around the world, including those who face mental health challenges to begin with. And one man who knows this full well is Matrika Devkota of Nepal. He's a mental health activist well, advocate who lives in Kathmandu. And after experiencing the um, discriminatory no, attitude to towards mental illness, no, the only mental health the list that was supposed to be in, the in his group, country. So I, um, I apologize. I'm just getting some other um, sound in my ear. I'll just. Can 
Please continue. Okay. Yes. So, Matrika has experienced the discriminatory attitudes towards mental illness, the lack of mental health resources in his own country through his, and through his very own experiences, he founded Kaushish, that's a self-help organization, where those with mental disorders, um, mental health disorders are given a voice and an opportunity to advocate on their behalf. He's received the Human Rights Award of the National Human Rights Commission of Nepal in 2015, the Dr. Gislan International Award for Breaking the Chain of Stigma in Mental Health issues in 2013, among other honors um, for his pioneering work. Matrika, you also have a personal experience with mental health illness, which led you um, to fight for the rights of persons um, with mental illnesses in Nepal to start uh, the civil society organization, Kaushish. Could you tell us more about why you did this? Hello, greeting. I'm part of the life that we have physical and mental integrity. Um, I realized that in the, this pandemic and before like mental integrity is missing in the integral part of the human being. I had a mental health issue when I was 15. I had a kind of symptom of depression and then uh, at the age of 19, I have fully stuff in my life. I have nothing. Then I was isolated in home for eight years. Then, but fortunately afterward, getting treatment and other practical support, then I realized that, you know, this, my negative experience to use as a, you know, person, as a positively, then, I realized that breaking the silence in the in the mental integrities like the disability, health, anywhere, and it is the part of integral part of human beings. So I first of all uh, started speaking in television and about my story, what happened. I spoke in national television. Then I made the like-minded people together. Then it started organizing courses and the only one organization of, uh, established and run by people with live experience. And through the crisis, even I had gone through the suicide attempt experience and like that. So now, uh, now after pandemic, you know, uh, more than 50% people are dying by suicide rather than pandemic. So we need to have a, quality care, mental health care, that is what is good for the people and um, that respects the diversity, quality and equal basis to other. And so we recently have filed case in the Supreme Court as a public litigation because no, there is not action plan or you know strategies or something doing for the suicide prevention. So we are keen on fighting for these discriminatory laws and this silence and on other ways continue to embrace the diversity of people with the mental health condition and helping the women, especially abundant women, and you know, giving them sustainable hope, dignity in their life, sustain sustainable in their own life as according to their choice and their dignity and you know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matrika, for your work. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to welcome now Monica Undun. She has a background in international law and uh, is a UNOHCHR Indigenous Fellowship. Monica is an Indigenous from Rote, Indonesia. She spent the last seven years working across the vast archipelago that makes up her country in the field of human rights, particularly Indigenous rights. And along the way, she's heard the voices of so many Indigenous people and communities who are all too often suppressed or silenced, whose rights are compromised or denied. Monica, welcome. Um, how did you come to work on Indigenous people rights as human rights defender, and in particular, as a woman human rights defender? Um, thank you, Liz. Um, that's an interesting question, as uh, what brought me to the field of uh, human rights in particular, indigenous rights is because I'm an indigenous myself. 
Um, and also uh, I've been working uh, with my, uh, the, my organization um, for seven years on the field of uh, indigenous rights. And um, in, in the past years, I saw that the struggle of indigenous peoples is real, like um, in the, almost in the whole area of Indonesia from east to west. And I've been to many indigenous communities who are in conflicts because um, uh, I'm doing advocacy work. So I'm assisting, also assisting many indigenous communities who are in conflicts. Well, not only with um, corporations, investors and business, but also um, with the government through their program like National Park Conservation. So the struggle is real and then the conflict is real. And then if we talk about um, the protection of uh, human rights defenders or uh, in specific the women human rights defenders, I can say that we are not protected enough by the law at the national level. Even though we, we have um, human rights law at the country, which is uh, the adoption of um, universal declaration of human rights. But um, now we have high number of criminalization in the country. So just last year, um, at the end of 2019, we documented a um, huge number, which is 262 indigenous leaders being criminalized. So it's a proof that the regulations um, that we have now to protect um, human rights defenders and specific uh, women human rights defenders and also uh, indigenous people's rights defenders are not enough. So um, I think that's also um, my personal experience as indigenous rights defenders that uh, we are being put in risk with the current situation. And, you know, this COVID-19 pandemic make it even worse. I mean, before it was already hard and it's getting harder during this pandemic because, you know, um, the government also uh, tried to um, limit limited the movement of the people, including indigenous peoples. So there are, there are so much uh, that ongoing uh, at the national level now uh, regarding the regulations that we have. So, um, you know, we have we have indigenous bills uh, that is on hold since 2009. So, and, and it remains a bill until now. And if we read in the bill, there is protection for uh, indigenous rights defenders, including me as, um, you know, uh, as um, indigenous peoples. So, and then at the other, at the other side, uh, the government during this COVID-19 pan uh, COVID pandemic tried to, they're trying to um, recover the economy of Indonesia, to build back the economy of Indonesia. But it, it's, I can't understand that because uh, it's not easy for you know, many countries, like also Joan has said, um, we're struggling, not only indigenous peoples, but also the country. But it's not an excuse for you to recover the economy and put aside the rights of indigenous peoples or uh, human rights in general. So um, I think what we can do as a community now, uh, we have to work together and um, for the government to involve indigenous peoples in the decision making process, especially, you know, the regulations and, um, you know, uh, policies uh, that are uh, regarding the rights of indigenous peoples itself. How can you protect, um, protect indigenous people's rights without involving them? That's just so wrong. So um, what we can do to build back better, I think, to work together uh, to uphold human rights and indigenous people's rights. Um, I think that's all it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, with that message again of participation um, of indigenous people, of all voices being absolutely key and interesting that you were talking about um, your work as a human rights defender, because that is the um, number one suggestion that we have coming up. We've asked our audience to write in to us at menti.com uh, using the word 301644 with uh, what their priorities are, what they would like to see in building back better and human rights defenders um, is, is, is still the biggest one. So thank you very much, Monica, for that and uh, and for your work. 
Now, last but not least, we turn to a remarkable um, LGBTQI activist whose work has made such an impact across the region, including over the past year amid the pandemic. We want to welcome Midnight Poon Kaset Watena. Midnight is gay. He's originally from rural Northeast Thailand, and he's now working as the executive director um, of APCOM, that's a leading LGBTQI um, rights and HIV organization in Asia Pacific. He has been recognized many times for this work. And this year he was recognized as Tatler's Gen T honoree for advocating for the rights of the LGBTQI communities in Asia and Futurelist 2020 as Thailand's human rights advocate. So Midnight Apcom has been in, in existence for well over a decade and your own story is remarkable from a very small town in rural Thailand now celebrated as an HIV and community hero. So based on that experience, um, why is it so important to fight for LGBTQI rights? What difference have you seen that work, that human rights work make? Um, thank you, Liz. Um, Swadikap uh, from Thailand, and um, happy um, Human Rights Day, everyone. Um, yeah, no, I think as a gay guy coming from rural part of the world, and you know, I had the fortunate opportunity to give me give a chance to study in the UK, and which otherwise I wouldn't have ever had, never ever dreamed of that um, I'd be, you know, certainly in this position, and certainly feeling like I can be in this position because all of my life, when um, I was younger and growing up. I didn't want to be different. I want to fit in. I didn't want to stand out. I um, don't want to be mocked. Um, and also feeling like, um, you know, you certainly are not special because you want to be the same. And I know that many people, LGBTI people in our region are going through that, um, are struggling through their self-acceptance, um, their sexuality. And there's not many spaces that communities can actually come together and talk about issues like this. Um, and then as our societies, um, as we grow up, you know, it, it doesn't allow that those spaces to happen. So for me to be part of APCOM, to be in this community as, uh, you know, working in over 30 countries in the region, connecting with um, over 200 community organizations, it is so important to have these spaces and then that the NGO sector working in, you know, marginalized groups, um, we've heard already from our wonderful speakers already, like this is such an important term issue to ensure that, you know, with the Sustainable Development Goals 2030, that no one is actually being, being left behind. So Liz, as you said, the APCOM has been in existence for over like 10 years. Um, and, you know, it's, it's still a struggle for Asian Pacific LGBTQI people. So 16 countries in our region still criminalize this homosexuality. So who you love, you know, how you love, that's a, crim that's a criminal, you're a criminal. And there are limited numbers of countries that recognizes some um, transgender people. Um, and then of course, there's limited numbers of countries that recognize the same sex um, relationships um, in Asia Pacific. HIV, uh, which is a big part of upcom work is still an issue, particularly for younger um, people um, in the key populations. So that's still a big task ahead for us. Um, in terms of imagining, reimagining something you know, better after COVID-19, we've already heard like the communities are at the forefront of actually reaching the most marginalized. Uh, all NGOs, community-based organizations are the first place of vulnerable people going to and ask for support, asking for help. And then during the COVID, APCOM was over flooded with um, requests, particularly for um, you know, emergency funding. And that's what we actually need in the region. We don't have a system for emergency funding for communities to then give out to, the, to um, the communities on the ground at grassroots levels. So what we had to do was to kind of like, uh, you know, how talk to donors, whether we can rebudget some of our programs for um, emergency funding or apply externally for funding. And that takes time. Uh, so, you know, in the beginning in uh, March, April, it was for PPE, sanitizers, um, and now it's more alive to sustainability. So, you know, food packages, and that is still needed. And communities that are really at the forefront are struggling and continue to struggle with that. So, um, you know, for me, for APCOM and uh, for our communities, it's so important to have that voice. So we have to be able to profile, to have to still say like, look, it's still an issue here. It's not just COVID-19. You know, COVID-19 really exacerbated, amplified all the injustices and the um, marginalization. So this is much even more so um, that we need to ensure that, uh, well, I'm so glad for mentee, you know, talking about human rights defenders, that's still, we need those people to have that voice. 
for um for that voice the platform that upcom has created for um a fourth year this year is the he hero awards so in the beginning of this year and in mid this year we didn't think we were going to do it so the hero awards um, stands for hab equality and rights so we give out um, special awards for communities activists uh, allies and organizations that are doing really really great work in this region but not being recognized about the struggles personal struggles um, and uh, even sacrifices that are making in their work. So we were able to do that this year at the end of um, November, and we were able to profile um, 25 honorees and um, give um, an award to uh, 11 really, really great um, people working on um, HIV and LGBTI rights in the region. So I think um, in terms of recommendations, definitely about the supporting community-led interventions, innovations now, I think in a way that now they have to um, work with new, new technologies and some communities don't have the access. Uh, how do we then remove, in, uh, remove policy barriers to ensure that there will be sustainability of the community-led interventions? So access to funding, particularly for capacity development, um, policy advocacy, especially uh, for LGBTI and also other uh, the marginalized communities because the voice, the presence, we really, 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 really do need that. And I would like to say thank you to the UN for you know also profiling our voices here in this um, instance. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Midnight. Um, I have so many questions, but we also have questions from the audience for all of our speakers. So I want to put um, some of them, uh, some of them to you all. Matrika, um, we would love, we'd like to hear a little bit more from you, and that is if we can ask you to give. Um, three key messages to the audience to remember, what would they be? Thank you, Elizabeth. That posting is like the like physical well-being, mental well-being should be, you know, also get prioritized equal to, you know, physical well-being. It should be integral part of well-being. Um, secondly, uh not just you know we get the services but you know quality services that is useful for the people and then thoroughly i would like to highlight about the barrier the legal barrier attitudinal barrier stigma that related with you know psychosocial distress those need to be removed and that will enable you know equitable societies for, you know, for people having the mental health condition as well. Thank you. Matrika, thank you very much for that. We have a question from um, our audience. Uh, another question as well for our audience for Pratishta. Um, Pratishta, this is, how can we begin to shift the mountain of stigma? I mean, you, you spoke about it in your address and discrimination against people with disabilities. How can we um, shift how people uh, look at persons with disabilities? And have you seen any good examples of approaches which are working? Um, I, think, I think this has to happen at three levels. First is your own individual level where we all can, you know, we all have that agency and we all can take responsibility for. Secondly, at a societal level, and thirdly, at the government level, efforts have to come from these three levels. And I think, you know, what, I, what, what people keep telling me is that, you know, uh, uh, we, we do not, we are not working with a specific organization, so we do not know what to do. And I always tell them that you do not have to always have your own organization or be connected with the United Nations to do something. You can always just start where you are in your own community, in your house, in your workspace. When you go out and you see perhaps there's a park or there's a restaurant that is not wheelchair accessible, you think about me. Okay, and you go to the authorities and you talk about it and you tell them because it's important that even non-disabled people become allies and, and become a part of this movement. And you really, really go out there as advocates, people with disabilities and ensure that more spaces are accessible so that when more spaces are accessible, more and more people with, dis with disabilities will be able to come out of their houses. Um, and when you go and then uh, when there will be more visible, when people with disabilities are more visible outside, I think that will really break stereotypes, you know, when you see more and more people, um, you know, doing just, just normal fun things. And uh, I think 
it really starts um, at uh, at the level of uh, perhaps schooling. You know, in in back in India, I was just uh, there talking uh, to a school principal. We have the Shriram schools in India. And they were actually, she was telling me that we ensure that every student with a disability, every child with a disability we have in the premises, in the, in the university of, of, the, of our school, we ensure that they are not sent to uh, special schools and they're, they, we invite them to our school and ensure that we have the services and facilities available for those students. So that from a very young age, non-disabled students and disabled students, they interact, they learn about each other, and they grow up to become more inclusive and sensitized citizens. Thank you for that, Pratishtha. Now I want to um, go back to our first speakers now, to Lagi, to uh, Ms. Ghosh and Ms. Carling. Again, so many follow-up questions to your um, wonderful addresses, but also questions from the audience. And I would love to, you know, after uh, we've heard from everyone, um, ask you all, the three of you, to make uh, a key suggestion, if, if you can, after you know everything that you've heard and marking uh, UN Human Rights Day. But what I'll do is I'll actually put um, some points of the questions uh, across to each speaker, and then if you can um, sum, sum that up into your key, key point or key recommendation, key takeaways. Lagi, I'll start, I'll start with you. Um, we have a question about children and uh, the number of children worldwide who are unable to access remote learning when COVID-19 closed their schools, 463 million. Um, what needs to happen to realize children's right to education? And what would your, um, as well as that, what would your key recommendations be for government leaders, you know, for people who are um, less able uh, to move as quickly or, or, or more or as quickly as we've seen um, is capable of this year. Thank you. I, I, and I think that's uh, that is really the case even here in the Pacific where young people are you know unable to access education due to the to the remoteness, uh, the geographical remoteness. Um, it's an issue that uh, seeks a multi-stakeholder approach, but really, I guess one of the practical uh, solution that I can, you know, that we could ask of government is to really look at uh, the budget priorities. Um, many times the investment are, uh, in, in, and the classic example is in Fiji, we are investing much more into our uh, you know, military complex uh, when that funds can be redirected to social investments, uh, education, um, social protection nets. So I think government need to take that bold and decisive uh, decision and you know, look into uh, redirecting fundings uh, that can be put to much better use, which can be Put into education, into the healthcare system, for the benefit of you know the common good, rather than investing in arms and military complexes, which only you know does nothing but bring only harm to the people. So I guess that's uh, the res the response that I have to that question. Thank you. Thank you, Lagi. Ms. Ghosh, I'm going to put that point to you. How do you convince governments to take those bold uh, policy decisions? Um, we have another a question for you on you know what models are avail available to show how governments can do things like remunerate unpaid care work. Um, can it you know how can it be brought within feasible public spending limits? Sorry, yes. Uh, so let me take the second question first. It's not really about you know, necessarily paying a salary to an unpaid care worker. It's much more about reducing the amount of unpaid care, partly by reducing some of the drudgery and the time, but also by redistributing it, handing it over more to society. That is a lot of things can be done through creches, through assisted care, through a lot of, you know, and paying those people properly, treating them with respect, dignity, and so on, redistributing within the household. So between the state, the market, society, and households, it shouldn't own, the burden doesn't have to fall only on mostly women within households. So that's, I think, really the point about the unpaid care. 
But that brings me to the larger point. And I, you know, I've been listening to this. I have to congratulate all of the organizers for putting together such an interesting group of people to talk about the aspects. But I think the participants here are really very smart. They've got it. You know, you can't do anything else until you have social mobilization. And you can't do that without those human rights defenders. So actually, they've got the point that this is about imbalances of power. They are global, they are regional, they are within societies, and they express in all kinds of ways. There are the, there's the, the economic power that we know about of large companies visa we workers, but there's the power of the state versus society. There is the power of, you know, the, uh, of people who see themselves as, you know, physically fit versus those who are differently able. There's the power of those who see themselves as sort of normal in a particular way versus those who have other sexual preferences and so on and so forth. All of these power imbalances can't be fought without mobilization. And for that, you need those human rights defenders. So in a sense, I think they've got it. They've got the point that you really have to ensure the democratic mobilization without which you cannot bring about any of these changes. And finally, if you, there's one message I would like to just say that what this has also made me realize this whole discussion is that it's not just enough for all of us to be working in our own thing, you know, me talking about economic policy, somebody else talking about gay rights or whatever. We have to come together. We have to build coalitions. We have to actually work with one another because we all want particular parts of something, but they're all very complementary. So we really need to think of many, many more ways of working together. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Ghosh. I want to pick up on something you said and uh, put our last question to Ms. Carling. You're talking about the importance of democratic mobilization, social mobilization. And we have a question for, actually for all the speakers, but I, I, I'll put it to Ms. Carling as well, who I know is in a, a very good um, position to talk about it, as are you, Ms. Ghosh. And that is, you know, how has COVID impacted the repressive campaigns against human rights defenders speaking out against violators? How has that affected social and democratic mobilization and um, how to to end those sort of that um, that repression of human rights defenders that has been heightened in some some places because of the pandemic uh, yeah uh, as I mentioned earlier that the the COVID-19 pandemic was actually used as a pretext and excuse to, to, to repress opposition or and, and uh, actions of, of uh, citizens that are demanding more accountability uh, by, by states. Uh, I've, I've seen that in the case of the, of the Philippines, for example, the, the, the communities that are protesting against the mining were uh, arrested in the name of violating uh, the lockdown. So, so that demonstrates how these uh, measures, these uh, health measures are actually being used to, even, to further uh, restrain uh, the actions of citizens against uh, repressive uh, governments. And, and in this context, uh, what, what is important for us is really that every single citizen, we need to stand up for our rights. Th that's pretty much needed. And we need to, last mentioned earlier, build coalitions, work together, and demand accountability from duty bearers to respect and protect human rights. They, they are empowered to do that. And if they don't, then citizen action should make that, uh, that change, that, that they need to be accountable. They need to provide access to, to, to justice, to, to, to victims, and to ensure that there is democratic space for citizens uh, to participate and that uh, uh, human rights defenders and environment defenders are, are, re are, are able to advance uh, the protection of our, our environment. While we are celebrating Human Rights Day today, I hope that there will be a time that we truly celebrate the meaning of human rights in every, every aspect of our life, that we're not talking anymore of people being killed, of people being arbitrarily arrested, of people silenced. I hope we are all reminded that if we don't stand up for our rights, we will always be talking about these violations. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Carling. And I want to thank all, um, 
all of our remarkable speakers um, for their contributions to the region, to the world, and of course, for being here today to inspire all of us um, as we seek to forge ahead in these challenging times. So before we go, let's take a look at our Mentimeter to see what um, you, the audience, have proposed that the UN human rights community focus on going forward and it is um, human rights defenders has remained the number one the biggest um, the biggest thing that's coming up on the Mentimeter some um, other notable things are freedom of expression children's rights climate change indigenous rights which uh, we were very fortunate fortunate enough to hear about both from Ms Carling and from Monica and Dun. economic rights which um, Ms Gosh touched about gender equality and um, oh, there's an, it, it, it's, it's a long list <laughs> and you will find it on uh, menti.com um, 3016 if the audience wants to take a look at the number of things um, that have come up there as uh, what people want the global the regional priorities to be in building back better thank you all very much thank you to everyone who sent in um, sent in their suggestions and um, it is also my pleasure to announce that the ideas that have been provided will form the basis for a year long conversation um, that we launched this event. And today is just the start of the conversation that we are intending to have over the course of the next year, leading to World Human Rights Day 2021. We'll be posting updates on future talks, events at the OHCHR Asia website. So do look out for that. Um, continue to stand up and support human rights for all as we've heard from all of our speakers the importance um, of standing up of uh, of participation and of holding uh, people to account of accountability so thank you all once again and stay safe stay well i'm elizabeth Puranam, wishing all of you um, a very good day wherever you are goodbye for now <laughs>